respiratory virus can be spread by one person and it can infect uh, uh, tens or, or hundreds of people at, at one time. We cannot predict today if the new influenza virus that's arising in China last winter will cause an epidemic of global proportions and kill 50 to 60 million people, or it'll affect two people in a city in southern China and we'll never see it again. If there's a pandemic, everybody will be affected. This has nothing to do with the status of development of a country. No question about the burden of disease, the rate of mortality will be higher as less developed the country is, but the spread will affect everyone. The ability to cross the species barrier, the ability to become established in humans, and then for one human to pass it to another. Those are the three features you need in order to create a, a epidemic or a pandemic. The last most dreadful uh, pandemic we have in mind was the so-called Spanish flu in 1918-19, which killed uh, millions of people. The Spanish flu was really devastating at that time. Uh, obviously, uh, the context plays an important role. It was at the end of the First World War with a lot of malnutrition and undernourishment and, and other factors which played a role. So we know that environmental factors are important, but also virological factors are important because there was not a lot of immunity against this strain in the population. And that led to a very paradox phenomenon that especially people between 20 and 40 years of age who usually have a very good immune system and, and are less uh, susceptible for infections. They were uh, the, pro the population which, which was most affected uh, from this uh, uh, virus and that was probably due to, to a lack of immunity against this special strain which was a new emerging strain at that time. 1918 is a, is a stain on the history of humanity really. 40, 50 million people died if you extrapolate to that today with a new population of the world, that might be in the order of 100 million people. And given the way I can fly to Shanghai tomorrow or New York in the next day, that ability to transmit around the world would allow an infection to get hold and spread globally within a very, very short space of time. The current uh, threat of viral infections is uh, mostly that influenza infections uh, um, are uh, the reason for dying of uh, like 250 to 500,000 uh, people per year in a normal year and even in pandemic years. The numbers are even higher, like millions of people worldwide. So this is the current problem, but there is also the potential of, for, for example, novel emerging virus infections like sars corona or mers coronavirus um, that potentially could um, uh, be a huge problem in the future. SARS really did change the world. SARS was a respir severe respiratory infection. It crossed from animals into humans. It was a zoonotic infection in China. And very quickly, because of the way the world is now, it spread to North America and did cause devastation. Changes in business practices, flights were cancelled, airports were empty. So these things can really make a difference both to health and, and also to world trade and economies. Research really has made tremendous uh, progress in the last uh, five to ten years on the virological level in order to better understand the, the, the virological uh, pa pa pathogen uh, factors uh, which, which uh, uh, are responsible for, for, for their success or which really make them a, a threat. But I, but I really think, you know, with new viruses, this can all, uh, is often a completely new situation. Of course, these are viruses from known virus families, so we know something but they can use different cellular receptors they can cause different syndromes in the host they can have different virological properties which we do not know at that very moment and which we are not uh, most often not really prepared for we have a bad system for working out how to treat people with newly emerging viruses, SARS, MERS-CoV, they're all the same, and we're very bad at conducting that early clinical research. That's one unmet need. The second unmet need, I think, is in diagnosis. 
we're still not good. Most of our diagnostic capacity actually relies on something developed, you know, almost 100 years ago. For viruses well known, and influenza is a well known one, uh, the capacity for uh, vaccine development and vaccine production is really high. What would happen if there is a new virus which has not appeared before is hard to say. The last example of a totally new virus was SARS in 2003. When you first face the emergence of a new virus, you don't know what's happening. That's the truth of it. It is chaos for those first few days and weeks after the emergence. You don't know if it's transmissible between people. You don't know if it's, it's transmissible when people have symptoms, when they're very sick, uh, before they have symptoms, after they have symptoms. You don't understand that biology of the virus. And therefore, in those first few uh, patients, uh, the risk to respiratory physicians, to intensive care physicians, to nurses uh, is high. And in SARS, uh, a lot of nurses, doctors, paramedics died because we didn't understand that infection. So the risk is very high and, and having lived through that myself, it is very, very frightening. If we take MERS-CoV as an example, we still do not know a treatment and MERS-CoV already exists since nearly two years now. Despite all the knowledge we have and all the possibilities which are present, we still have not really elucidated the mechanism and can really find a, find a good treatment for, for this virus. What is absolutely crucial is that infection control measures in hospitals are not just there uh, in response to something, but they're in place all of the time. If you have really good infection control measures in hospital all the time, you you reduce that risk significantly. The difficulty is many of these things happen on a Sunday night. They happen on Christmas Eve. They happen on the eve of New Year in China. And people, infection control measures are not perfectly in place. And therefore, it spreads within hospital professionals. So ways to, to improve the, the, the management of pandemics uh, clearly would uh, uh, include uh, very open uh, communication, very early communication uh, to uh, the international, uh, yeah, uh, not only authorities, but also other scientific organizations which there are. And I think we are in the process of building an international network to overcome this. But number two would be to really share biological material in order to develop as quickly as possible an intervention. And that would include, for example, if we talk about respiratory viral uh, pandemics, also the exchange of convalescent plasma. So this is a concept where survivors which have built antibodies against the virus uh, would, would share uh, some, some of their, these antibodies with patients who are at, at need uh, at the intensive care unit in order to help them. And there are, we have some indication that this is helpful. We should have better vaccines, which means they should be more easily to produce and cheaper producible. They should not need a cold chain uh, and they should be more immunogenic than they are at the moment. Um, and uh, we should, uh, regarding viral infections, have better antivirals than we have today. We should have drugs that increase the tolerance against our immune response and against pathogenic factors. And we should have drugs that improve repair mechanisms. These are short course treatments. You might not want to use a drug you've developed at great cost. How are we going to afford to pay for that? And this is where governments are going to have to step into that space to facilitate and encourage drug companies, academics, to develop new antibiotics, new antiviral drugs, and take them through to market. Because we do not have uh, targets for antiviral efficiency, uh, we need to stimulate uh, basic research to overcome the problem. We should have and do not have um, strategies that really um, reduce the, the uh, excessive inflammatory response that viruses induce in our patients. There is, for example, uh, the uh, idea to use inhalative GM CSF, which could, be, uh, could possibly be uh, a good idea. Um, and there has been uh, some uh, retrospective uh, data showing that, uh, for example, statins, which reduce inflammation, are more, um, have, have a higher potential to uh, reduce 
uh, death rates in influenza uh, as compared to neuraminidase inhibitors, but um, these are not really established therapies, so to say. We don't understand the species barrier between uh, animals and humans, and we don't understand what it takes to establish an infection in human beings. And that bit of biology is the key missing ingredient in order for us to be able to understand and predict what will happen to it, the emergence of a new epidemic. In a world which has to deal with so many problems, it's sometimes difficult to, to make clear what a huge threat emerging viral infections are to mankind and, and to, to really take, take the right decisions at the right time to, to have more efforts uh, to, to, to combat them.